<coughs> Hi, I'm Jan Witkowski. I'm director of the Banbury Centre here at Corspring Harbour Laboratory. And this is the uh, fourth day of the 80th Cold Spring Harbour Symposium on Quantitative Biology. It still takes me a while to get that off properly. <laughs> uh, and I'm delighted to have here with me uh, Svante Parbo uh, from Germany, from the Max Planck Institute uh, for Evolutionary Anthropology. That's right. That's even yes. more of a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> so Svante, you're, you're doing double duty here. Mm -hmm. you're, you're both giving a, a scientific talk in the morning and you're going to be giving the Dorcas Cummings mm -hmm. lecture in the afternoon. Uh, so I've not heard you give you this talk. Yes, so so uh, tell me a little bit about what you're going to be talking about in the morning. Well, so in the morning I will talk about what we have learned by now having a high quality Neanderthal genome since last year, which is of a quality similar to a genome you will mm. sequence from a present day person today, and also high quality genome from this relatives of Neanderthals in Asia that we discovered a few years ago, the Denisovans, mm -hmm. and how we can now compare these genomes to each other and discover that they have contributed to the gene pool of people today, Neanderthals to everyone outside Africa, and Denisovans particularly to people in the Pacific, but also in the Asian mainland. We'll talk a bit about what this genetic contribution means mm -hmm. physiologically today, and also about the fact that we can see that they have mixed with each other, that Neanderthals have contributed a bit to Denisovans, and quite interestingly that Denisovans have mixed with someone else, some er other group of extinct hominins that have diverged over a million years ago from the human lineage. So this may be something like Homo erectus or something mm. like that mm. in Asia. Mm. So one message will sort to be that these groups have always mixed with each other, They've always been gene flow between the groups. Despite the Denisovans' geographic, relatively geographic isolation from the Neanderthals, or am I...? Yes, yeah, so it's curious in a way that we have discovered remains of Denisovans and sequence the genome just from one site, which is a cave in southern Siberia, in the Altai Mountains, uh -huh. close to the border to Mongolia and China. But we see a contribution genetically from this group, particularly in the Pacific. And of course we don't really mm. think that the ancestors of people in Papua New Guinea today have been in Siberia. We rather think that these Denisovans have been more widespread in the past, that they've been somewhere in Southeast Asia or so, where the ancestors of the people in Oceania today were able to meet them. But it's indeed a big, big sort of mystery still how widespread the Denisovans were and at what time they existed mm. where. Mm. Let me ask you, not, not a technical question, but a, a technical aspect of your work. How how difficult is it these days to recover DNA from ancient remains? I mean, it obviously presupposes that you, you find decently preserved bones. Um, I mean, you said you have one, you have one high-quality Neanderthal sequence, yes. uh, and that's presumably conditional upon that that particular sample was a particularly good sample. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it is still the case that say, most Neanderthal remains we test, we cannot retrieve any DNA. So, and this site in Siberia, the Nisova cave, it's not a permafrost site, so we actually don't understand why preservation is particularly good there. So big emphasis the last three, four years in our group have been to develop better methods to allow us to retrieve genomes also where preservation isn't that good. Mm -hmm. And there are many aspects today but to that, but one is, for example, to be able to extract shorter molecules, because it's really the situation in most bones that there is sort of almost an exponential increase of molecules as you go to shorter size. So whereas we earlier analyzed things that were only about 35 base pairs in length, we're now pushing that down towards 25. Mm -hmm. And that has to do then with extraction methods and how you make libraries, but also to a big extent about informatics and the algorithms you have to now match these short fragments to the human genome. Yeah. 
when you often have also large excess of bacterial DNA there that is also fragmented. So it's not that you just have fragments that you know have to fit somewhere in the human genome, so to say. You, they might also come from some totally different organism. Mm -hmm. The, um, of course, it, it's always an, a key, an interesting question about what proportion of our genome mm -hmm. can, can be traced to, to the Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that figure these days? Well, so is that rather a simplistic way of asking? It, it is a sort of rather difficult question to answer too, because when we have a long piece that come from Neanderthals, it's quite easy to mm -hmm. recognize that it's there. But when pieces get shorter, you have less information to be sure if it really comes from Neanderthals, or to distinguish alternative that it actually comes from the common ancestor shared with Neanderthals somewhere mm -hmm. half a million years ago or so. But clearly somewhere between one and two percent of genomes of people from Europe or Asia come from Neanderthals, slightly more in Asia actually about 20% more, so say instead of 1%, 1.2% or so in Asians. Most likely due to an extra sort of mixture with Neanderthals that happen in the ancestors of mm -hmm. Asians. Is there anything uh, characteristic about the portions of the Neanderthal genome mm -hmm. that modern Homo sapiens mm -hmm. has retained or, mm -hmm. or, or has? Well, so, one interesting aspect is then to go across the genome and see where do we find regions that come from Neanderthals that have risen to high frequency today, mm. that are not there in one or two or three percent of us, but are there in 60, 70, 80 percent of people outside Africa. So you can then look what things are there and rather sort of disappointing perhaps the only group of genes that are really over there or are keratins. So structural proteins and skin and hair. We don't understand quite what that means. But in the future when we understand what these variants do, I'm sure we'll find out that some aspect of hair or skin, how it looks or functions come from Neanderthals. Hmm. There are also other genes that people have shown come from Neanderthals where variants of these genes are important. It applies to the immune system, for example. It applies to some genes that have to do with metabolism. There is a risk variant of a lipid transporter that confirms risk for type 2 diabetes. And this risk allele that's prevalent in Asians and Native Americans come from Neanderthals. And very interestingly, Rasmus Nielsen's group at Berkeley showed that there is a variant in Tibetans that exists in about 80% of Tibetans that confirms an advantage to living at low oxygen tensions, at high yeah. altitudes mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the Himalayas. And that variant comes not from Neanderthals, it seems, but from Denisovans. So it's sort of fascinating to me that yeah. perhaps one wouldn't have had this high populations, numerous populations in Tibet if it hadn't been this contribution yeah. from Denisovans. And you said there's only one site where Denisovans have been found? Yes. So it's only this cave site in the Altai Mountains where we, there is a little finger bone from which oh, we yes, determine the, right. the sequence. And there are three teeth there where we have found uh, Denisovan mm -hmm. DNA in the teeth. And do you think that's because other well, it's obvious that other places haven't yet been found. But do you think other places exist and they've not been found, or do you think there's some something rather yeah. peculiar about this one, this one I, site? I think we may already have remains of Denisovans elsewhere, for example, in China, since we don't know their morphology. Yes. It may be that if we did that, we would realize that some things that we know from China, for example, are Denisovans. Yeah. Yeah. So I think two things might happen in the future. Either we are able to retrieve DNA from other remains elsewhere and show that they are Denisovans and learn about the morphology that way, or the Russian colleagues who excavated the Denisova cave will indeed find larger bones who will know the morphology and be able to recognize Denisovans elsewhere. Mm. Do you find, again, it can't apply, this can't apply to the Denisovans because you only got one side, I mean, are there other artifacts that are found in the Neanderthal sites that help you, I don't know, 
uh, maybe help determine what period of your what age you're, you're uh, dealing with? Uh, so for more recent Neanderthals one can actually use carbon dating mm. but that fades out about 40, 50,000 years ago, about the time when Neanderthals actually begin to disappear and disappear. So for older periods it's actually other types of dating methods one, one would have to use which are less reliable. And interestingly when we have high coverage genomes now, we begin to be able to date by looking mm, at the divergence. Yes, yeah. to look at the yeah. sort of missing mutations that we see, that the lineage leading to these individuals are actually shorter because they lived, say, 60, yes, 70, 80,000 years yeah. ago and haven't accumulated as much mutations as people today. How many how many Neanderthals do you have sequenced from? You have this one very good one, yes. but the, you have shorter sequences from yes. other... so we have from a site in Croatia, we have a composite of three different individuals and we have actually unpublished one additional individual from there where we hope to get to high coverage, mm. high quality genome. There is from the Caucasus, there is one individual, in R Russian Caucasus, mm. and then there are exons sequences from, um, from Spain and from Croatia, so we have pulled out by DNA capture methods mm. as the protein coding mm. parts of the genomes mm. that we mm. have then at high quality. Um, does, does having this one high quality sequence now help you deal with the problem you mentioned earlier of, of trying to assemble smaller and smaller sequences? I mean, you have a mm. essentially you now have a reference sequence. Yes, yes. Um, the Neanderthals are still so close to people today, so it doesn't really help us no. that much no. in that respect. It is really problematic once you come down towards 25 days per so shorter. Yeah. And it's also only around two-thirds of the human genome that we can reliably map to. So all parts that are repetitive, yeah. we can't. We can only statistically say, well, this repeat seems to be there in this and this many copies, but we cannot reconstruct from which copies which fragments come. So let, let's finish on a, a much more general point. Mm -hmm. uh, how do, when you go and give talks, as similar to the one you'll give tomorrow evening, how do, how do, you know, I was going to say ordinary people, how do lay people respond to the stories about Neanderthals? What, what sort of reaction do you get? And they, do, do they want to know whether their grandmother or mm -hmm. the other? <laughs> yes, I think in general <laughs> people are quite fascinated mm. by the fact that Neanderthals are then not totally extinct, if you like. Mm. They live on a mm. little bit in many of us today, if your roots are from outside Africa. And that we can actually now, when we have projects such as the Thousand Genomes Project, we've had genome sequence from many, many individuals, sort of jump from individual to individual yes. today yeah. and reconstruct how much yeah, yeah. of the Neanderthal yeah. genome still exists in us today. And that, the jury is still out on how much that is, but in the order of at least 40% or so of the Neanderthal mm -hmm. genome is still around. All the good qualities, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Sadie, thank you very much. Thank you.